the parable of the great pearl. Are there any collectors here? Yeah, what do you collect, Tony? Vintage clothes, anything else? My family have collected all sorts of things, like teapots and teaspoons, uh, beer mats and beer towels. What do you collect? Ornamental frogs, that's a good... <laughs> when I was a lad, I used to collect stamps. I was quite keen on it, and I used to get the catalogues out of the library and study them. Most of my collection was sort of passed on to me, and I had this wonderful collection of Danzig stamps, which were long horse and carriages. But I had a good English selection too. But as a nine-year-old, I would have swapped my whole set for one stamp. And it was a dull-looking stamp with Queen Victoria's head on, the Penny Black. And if I could have got the Penny Black, then everybody that came into my council house, I would have had to show them whether they saw the true value of it or not. Now, Jesus told a parable about a merchant who collected and traded in pearls. But why did he choose pearl? Because there's all sorts of precious gems he could have talked about and other things that you traded. With a pearl, it's born in the dark on the seabed in a mollusk. Could be an oyster. And it sits there in its two shells which are crammed together. It opens up the shell to feed and it feeds off the plankton in the sea. But occasionally, a parasite or some other foreign body gets into the oyster between the shells and causes it pain and irritation. So it has a defence mechanism in which it secretes a crystalline substance called NACA. And it will coat the irritant in this and it will carry on doing that year after year, long after the pain's gone. It forms this wonderful pearl inside the shell. Now, they reckon perhaps one in 10,000 oysters will have a pearl in them. So you can see how rare they are. Just before the time of Jesus, the queen and pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra, she was talking to her friend, the Roman general, Mark Antony, and she was trying to convince him that Egypt had a heritage and wealth that was beyond conquer. And to do this, she said, I will prove to you this. I will put on the most expensive meal ever thrown as a wager. And he accepted the wager, and he turns up for this meal, and the table is bare. There are two empty plates and two goblets of wine. Mark Antony sits down, and Cleopatra sits down, and she takes off one of her two earrings. And there are huge pearls. And she has this pearl crushed in front of him, pours the powder into the wine, and knocks it back. Then she offers the other pearl to Mark Antony as his meal, which he declines and accepts that she's won the wager. Pliny the Elder, who came along about the time of Jesus, and he said that these pearls were worth 60 million sesterces. That's enough fine silver for 50 tonnes of weight, which is the weight of 20 male elephants or a passenger jet. So this was an expensive pearl. So you can see how expensive they can get. And in the time of Jesus, the pearl would have been the most expensive thing that you could possibly collect or trade. But why did Jesus use parables anyway? What's the point in a parable, which is like a picture or metaphor? Well, modern communicators tell us that a metaphor can get into our subconsciouses, past the barrier that our conscious minds put there. If I asked you to name a ski jumper, any ski jumper, who would you say? Eddie the Eagle. Eddie the Eagle. Now, this was 1988 in Colgreen. Eddie, who was too heavy for ski jumping, he didn't have the proper equipment, he was long-sighted, so he had thick glasses which steamed up when he was on the slope so he couldn't see where he was going. We were enraptured watching him in the Olympics. Would he make it? Would he survive? And of course, he did. He came last, broke the English record. But do you remember who won it? Do you remember what his real name was? Martin Edwards. But it's that metaphor, isn't it, of Eddie the Eagle that has stuck in our conscience and just stayed there for decades. So Jesus was using this. And in Matthew 13, we see the first set of eight parables. Four of them are spoken from a boat. One of those he explained on the time. A bit later, he went back to his place he called home in Capernaum with his disciples and then explained another one of them but he put down four new parables and it didn't explain any of them because he's putting these concepts in their minds and then it's up to them to dig deep and question it and get out the true meaning so he told this parable the second of the ones he told the disciples in the home said there was a merchant looking for fine pearls 
He came across one of great value, went away, sold everything he had, and then acquired the pearl. Now Jesus would have been very familiar with merchants because he was brought up on a trade route. And these guys on the trade routes, they would travel long distances to find the things they wanted to sell and then find the right markets across the known world. Jesus describes this merchant. He travelled a long way and he came across a pearl and recognised it to be of great value. It was something he wasn't expecting to find but it sort of smacked him in its face with the beauty of this pearl. It built in him a desire for it. He had to have this pearl and he was determined to do whatever it took to get this pearl. He goes away, perhaps he put a deposit down, he goes along his trade routes and he sells all his other pearls and everything he had and then he comes back and acquires the pearl. And he was overjoyed with it. It cost him everything but he still felt he had a great bargain. So there's a concept here that Jesus is putting out that when it comes to the kingdom of God when it comes to our Christianity, there is something or someone or some things that is worth giving up everything for. That's the concept, and it goes. But then our front mind say, well, who is the pearl? What is the pearl? What do you think? Some of you say Jesus? You're in good company if you say Jesus, because the great preacher Charles Spurgeon gave strong, convincing arguments why Jesus is the pearl of great price, and many others too. However, there are also great men and women that say, no, that can't be true because we don't seek after God like he seeks us out. And we can't pay for Jesus and for salvation because it's a free gift. And they put down very convincing arguments as to why the church is the pearl of great price and Jesus is the merchant. And after 2,000 years of Jesus saying this simple parable and all the study and all the meditation, we're divided on what it means. So I'm thinking, I can't preach on a parable that I don't understand about. So I'm there searching through the other parables. Is there a pattern? You know, is the kingdom of God figure always the subject or the object? There was nothing really in there. So in desperation, I contacted a friend who was a great Bible scholar. And he gave me an insight about parables. And he said, look at parables, not as a a sequential teaching of the kingdom of God, but look at them as photographs in an album. So I pictured them as photos in a wedding album. You know, my daughter got married last year. What a great day it was. And I enjoyed going online on the social media and picking off photographs that other people had taken and putting together like a digital album because it was seen through different lenses. It didn't matter what order they were in, each photo had a different picture, a different angle on the wedding. You could see some of the colours, the wonderful venues, what they were eating, etc. It was a great way of seeing the day without being there. So I started praying into this idea. And I got a picture. I was actually in the room with Jesus and his disciples in my mind's eye. I could see a long table in the middle of the room, a long low table. On one side of it reclining is Jesus. On the other side, at 45 degrees, are all his disciples. At the end of the table is a big window with sun streaming through it. And on the table, there was one item only, raised to eye level, and it was the most enormous pearl you'd ever seen. Absolutely beautiful. I'm there with my camera, so I go round behind where the disciples are, and I take a photo of what they can see. And as they look forward, they can see something which doesn't just reflect the light, but seems to be the source of light. And it's so beautiful, and their heart goes out, And they know that they will give their whole lives, whatever it takes, for that thing. And then they see the pearl. Because what they first see is Jesus. And when they first saw Jesus, they knew there was something different in Jesus. He could be a great prophet, he might even be the Messiah. And they wanted, they desired him, and they were determined to do whatever it took to be part of that intimate relationship with him. And Matthew left his tax booth, his plum Roman job. Andrew and Peter, James and John, they left their fishing boats with Zebedee. They gave it all up and they followed Jesus. And wow, was it worth it. It He was the greatest teacher ever, the great poet ever. They lived in communion with him. They went off and did the things he did. They later became great missionaries and evangelists and church leaders. Was it worth them giving up everything else for? Of course it was. 
because they recognised and experienced the true value of Jesus Christ. And we as his followers, as his disciples, we also need to see the true value of Jesus Christ. What is the value to us? He promises that we'll be adopted into his family, that we'll be co-heirs with Christ, princes and princesses of the kingdom of God. He promises us the fruit of the Spirit, his love, joy and peace, his patience, his kindness and faithfulness. He'll build in us our goodness, gentleness and self-control, help us to be more like Jesus. If that's not enough, he promises us the power and authority of the Holy Spirit. That we can do things in the power of the Spirit like he did. Do great things like him. And even more, he says, as we press into that relationship. And if that's not enough, he promises us eternal life. That we can be with him and with our Christian friends and family forever. What great value there is in following Jesus. But you say, well, what's it going to cost? Well, actually, you can't pay anything for it. You can't do anything for it. Because everything we have is on loan from God anyway. It's a free gift. So where does the cost come in? Well, the cost is in getting to that point where we recognise that Jesus is of that true value, like the disciples did. So at the point at which we can be determined to follow him. And some people won't do that because they can never get past some things in their life, like their self-pride. If we've got self-pride and we think we can do it on our own strength, you know, we've got to give that up. That's part of the cost. There may be things in our lives that are barriers to us seeing the true value of Jesus. It may be possessions. It might be lies we've been told. It may be other distractions in our life. So we need to get to that point where we recognise the true value. Jesus is truly magnificent. And without a shadow of a doubt, he is the pearl of great value. So then I take my camera in my picture, in my mind's eye, and I take it to behind Jesus. And I can now see what Jesus sees. And the light is streaming down through the window. And he can see something that greatly reflects the light. Something with wonderful colours, with so much potential and beauty, that he knows he'd give everything for. And then he sees the pearl. Because the first thing he sees... It's his disciples. And when he first saw his disciples, he knew that in these men, there were young men that would give everything for him, that he could trust with his mission, that would follow him to the end. There was one he had to accept that was going to betray him. That was part of the purpose. But for the others, he knew they would be dedicated to him and follow him through. He could see the true potential in those disciples. He recognised that even before they were born. And his desire was so great that he would give up everything Jesus would. He'd give up heaven, where he has his lovely relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the security of heaven, he'd come down and take on bodily form. Even if it meant being sacrificed on the cross. He'd give up everything for his disciples. And just like he loved his disciples, he loves his church in the same way and gives up everything for us. I was reading yesterday about a forest fire. If a forest fire is taken up at nesting time, the mother birds, rather than fly to safety, would stay there and try and shield their chicks from the heat. I'm thinking, wow, if God can put so much love in a mother bird that she will stay and die on her nest, protecting her young ones, how much more love does he put into Jesus for us? How much more (laughs) does Jesus love us? You know, because he's got a plan. He wants the whole world to come and be united under God's love. That was his plan when he arrived in Galilee. And these young men were going to be the start of that plan. And they were going to take the message out to us and we take it out beyond. And we're not doing too bad. The last hundred years the church has quadrupled in size. There's about two billion believers in Jesus. But the work's still to, to be done. We're only one generation away from extinction. We have to keep passing on the baton. And he's got no backup plan. We're it. He loves us so much that he wants to engage with us to do his work. We are his church. He'll give everything for us, the church. So without a shadow of a doubt, the church is the pearl of great price. But there are some people who won't join the church. And that's because they don't see the true value of Jesus and of what's on offer. And also they don't realise that there's a part of us, it's not just mind and body, there's a soul which yearns for connectivity with God. 
A lot of people are very good at accumulating and collecting material wealth and possessions. And they can build up great wealth and great fame and fortune. But testimony after testimony says that when they get to that position, there's a longing and an emptiness inside. A lot of people in that situation will even turn to drugs or worse. And the psalmist says that our soul pants for God like a deer pants for water. Have you got a dog at home? On a hot day, what does it do? It pants for water, doesn't it? Unless we connect with God, unless we find that position in God's kingdom where we're doing his will, then there will always be an emptiness and an aching inside of us for God. And then in my picture, quite unexpectedly, Jesus snatches my camera off me. And he takes a photo of me. And he smiles and says, one for the album. And I realised that collectively, as disciples and followers, we're precious, but individually, we're also of great value. Now, you might be sitting here this morning and saying, I don't feel of great value. I'm not an important person. Oh, I'm too old to be of value. I'm past my sell by date. You might think that. People might have put you down in your past. If you had to write your own price tag, it would be quite small, wouldn't it? It might be. But our value is what Jesus says it is. It's the price he's willing to pay. You know, I could value your house or your car, but I'd probably be a bit off the mark, wouldn't I? What it's really worth is what someone else will pay for it. My lad collected football stickers during the last Soccer World Cup with a friend. And it seemed like the whole school were collecting these football stickers. You had to collect about 650, and then, of course, you swap them. And even teachers were asking him to see them after the lesson. He'd walk into their office, they'd shut the door and get out their swaps. And he got to the last day of the World Cup. Miraculously, he only had one sticker to get. And he'd accumulated all of these swaps. So he walks in to a year nine registration. He stands in the doorway with this big rod of swaps and said, anyone that has Hadrovic of Bosnia can have all my swaps. And everyone rushed to look through their stickers. And one lad lifted it up. I have Hadrovic of Bosnia. And he goes over, checks, and gives them all of his swaps. And he was delighted. And that boy, when he woke up in the morning, if he'd looked at Hadrovic of Bosnia, he would have been worth, perhaps in his mind, one swap. But he didn't understand its true value. Because that day, it was worth the whole wad of Mars's swaps. Was Mars happy with that? Of course he was. If he'd had 400, he would have given that up because the swaps are worthless when you've completed your collection. Everybody was happy. It was a great outcome. And Jesus places such a value on you. Your price tag is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. He sacrificed himself for you. And we're like an oyster, aren't we? We start off sitting on the bed of the ocean and Jesus reaches down into the darkness and he pulls us up into the light. And we've got our two shells clammed over our heart. And he won't open up the shells. He invites us to open it up ourselves. Just like the clam opens to feed. We have to open it ourselves. And then he can see the impurity in us. He can see the irritation, the pain inside of us. And he can wrap it around in his love. Just like the oyster wraps around the impurity and produces this beautiful pearl. He can reach into our hearts and produce something beautiful in us. I mean, the word pearl means purity. And as we give up our old life and our sinful life, he replaces it with pure white robes, with his cleanliness. And just like the light reflects off the pearl, the light of the sun, the son of God, will reflect off us. And just like a nine-year-old boy collecting stamps with his penny black, Jesus has you and he says, isn't she beautiful? Isn't he wonderful? He's so proud of you. He loves you so much. He'd give up anything for you. And I realise it without a shadow of a doubt. You are the pearl of great price. And he loves you dearly. Just be sure that your photo is in his wedding album. Amen? Amen.